Hello, everyone. Welcome to the Genuinely Interested Podcast, a podcast where I chat with people that I'm genuinely interested in, people that I want to get their story, get a better understanding of who they are, what they've been through, and where they're going, and hopefully in the process learn something about myself and leave just a little bit wiser, a little bit better, a little bit smarter. Uh, today on the podcast, I have Cam F. F. Awesome who is an Olympic boxer, vegan, youth speaker, and all around super, super cool dude. I had a lot of fun talking to him, and I felt like we could have talked for hours because we had so many shared interests. So I had a really great time talking to this guy. Uh, so yeah, I hope you enjoy this conversation as much as I did. Here is Cam F. Awesome. Hey, Cam, you hear me? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Hey, how you doing, man? Thanks for coming on. Oh, thanks for having me. Thanks for having me. Yeah, man, I've uh, actually been wanting to talk to you for a long time since uh, I think since I saw the the documentary Counterpunch, you were oh, just nice, such nice. a such a dominant figure in in that documentary, and uh, and then when I heard you were vegan, I was like, okay, wow, that's you know that's insane. Yeah. You don't really hear that too much, especially not in in MMA or boxing or any combat sports. So maybe kind of tell us a little bit how you got into that, and and you know just oh. a little background about yourself yeah. as well. Oh, dope. Uh, so uh, I'm originally from Long Island, New York. And when I was in uh, my senior year in high school, I just joined a gym to lose weight. Uh, it, was, it just happened to be a, be a boxing gym. It was the only free gym in the neighborhood. So uh, that's why I originally chose chose to get into boxing and uh, it worked out pretty well. And I I, I uh, eventually got ranked number one within the first couple of years and been on the USA national team ever since. And in 2013, uh, I, uh, 2012, I believe, uh, lost the bet and did the, had to do the 28 day engine two challenge. And what, that's how I challenge? got the whole vegan thing. The, uh, engine oh, two. The, oh, okay. Okay. I know that one. Yeah. 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 That's, that's yeah, so the one. Yeah. That, that one. That's yeah, how I originally yeah. got involved in all, all the vegan stuff. Uh, I, I wouldn't have ever done it for any other reason. So, <laughs> well, yeah, what was the I, bet? Uh, Manny Pacquiao versus Timothy Bradley. Oh, okay, okay. <laughs> yeah, it was a boxing match. Yeah. Uh, also, just for the record, uh, no one thought that Bradley won, but yeah, that's true. <laughs> that is true. <laughs> but he he's got that style where he can just you know bob and weave and duck and and eventually somehow <laughs> win. But yeah, <laughs> yeah. So yes. yeah, so that's how you got into veganism, and then how did you get? In, how did you know? Because I mean, you're being a little humble. I mean, if I I, I was looking on the yeah. website, I could just kind of run through the accolades. It's six times yeah. U.S. national champion, four time Golden Glove national champion, two time Olympic trail champion, heavyweight boxer, former captain of the USA national boxing team, and you're a le, you know yeah. legit uh, boxer. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I yeah, it still sounds weird. I don't really think of myself as a boxer, okay. uh, but I think it's cool when other people do. That's oh, definitely. I mean, even yeah. in the documentary, I mean, I, you know, I've loved martial arts my whole life. Uh, you know, kickboxing, um, Muay Thai that I've been doing for many, many years. But uh, you know, just everything. And um, you know, you you know, and even in the documentary, I think they say this: like you have a an awkward style, but it's an awkward style that works. Yeah. Yeah, Kenny right. Powers said uh, fundamentals are crutches for the untalented. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, so, so how did you get into into the documentary? Uh, actually, I was weirdly filming... Uh, I was weirdly filming another documentary from the ground up. Uh, yes, I saw and, that one. Yeah, I was in that one as well. And uh, they... Someone reached out to me about, like, filming a documentary. I'm like, Oh, I'm already here. And it was, it was actually counterpunch. So I had started filming two documentaries at the same time and not, and didn't know it was two different ones. <laughs> wow. It's a downfall of when you're your own agent. <laughs> yeah. Right. <laughs> yeah. But the great thing as well. So yeah, yeah, I mean, it worked out. <laughs> yeah. I might actually watch both of the documentaries. I um, mean, you were kind of, you know, shown with a lot of other great, uh, vegan athletes. Um, I think there was, uh, you know, Rich Roll and uh, Scott Jurek, Tory Washington, yeah. Griff Whale, and all these amazing guys that have kind of, you know, I think 
changed a little bit how people, or maybe a lot, I think actually how people see and view vegans, especially in, 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 in athletics. Um, yeah. Do you think that that's something that's changing in the martial arts world aspect as well? Because, you know, I, I see like NFL, uh, NBA, like there's a lot, uh, or uh, ultra marathon runners or swimmers, a lot of like, I think tennis as well. You'll see vegans, but in, in martial arts, MMA, there's not really too many of them. Yeah, and I, I think uh, that's that's going to be changing because there's been a lot of you know there's been a lot of misinformation about uh, about strength and conditioning and things of that sort and recovery time, and I don't believe that uh, I, I don't believe that people who I mean, the kind of the old school thinking, old school way of thinking of like uh, eating meat and like for example of of the old school thinking back in the day they used to say water made you weak. Like in the boxing really? world. <laughs> so like okay. guys would just be sparring and fighting and training dehydrated because they thought it made you stronger. Like eventually that yeah. sounds, I just said it. I said that to you and you laugh <laughs> because you're like, that's silly. I feel like yeah. we're going to get to the point where people know enough about the veganism. And even if they don't become vegan completely, uh, they'll start to uh, reduce meat out of their diet just for health reasons. Yeah, it's it's kind of like there was a there was a point in time where doctors were doing commercials for cigarettes, right? It's like, no, oh, this yeah, is healthy. I, I Our Marlboro is the favorite brand. You should definitely enjoy <laughs> this, uh, you know, f- 10 times a day, whatever it is. Yeah, like I actually speak about that in school. I show kids like pictures of uh of doctors recommending stuff in newspapers about smoking. I'm like just <laughs> that's nuts to me. It is. It is. So, yeah. so yeah. So you're on a speaking tour right now, right? Uh, yeah. Yeah. So I've, I've been doing a, a lot of youth speaking, visiting uh, high schools, middle schools, uh, sometimes elementary schools, speaking about uh, bullying, vaping, appropriate social media use, uh, goal settings, and resilience. So, oh. uh, basically doing that for uh, for a while now. So, and what uh, has the years. response been from? That's amazing. How's the response been from uh, from from the kids? Oh, the kids, uh, the kids love it. So I didn't know how to. I, when I've I've been doing comedy since like 2012, uh, but I didn't okay. know how to write a speech. But I knew how to write a joke. So uh, my my school assemblies and presentations are just uh, a lot of it's just humor and jokes, and each joke has a moral or a message. So kids uh, enjoy it. So they listen to me because if you get them to listen, they'll learn. If you get them, if you get them to laugh, you get them to listen. If you get them to listen, you get them to learn. Get them to learn. Mission accomplished. Uh, yeah. And uh, weirdly, I have credibility as a boxer because kids think that's cool. Yeah. Oh, 100 percent. Yeah. Yeah. There's uh, th- there's something about you know a big strong guy. I remember there was um, I uh, my coach, my Muay Thai coach back home. He used to go around, uh, also, you know, talking in schools and, and trying to like pick up the, the, the quote unquote problematic kids to come and, and take lessons, uh, you know, back, back in uh, our academy. And, um, <laughs> there was one time I, one of the kids was heckling him because he, you know, he was like, no, this, you know, this is bullshit. This is this, this is that. And he just, he was like, all right, you know, come up here. And I think he just landed like a very delicate low kick on this kid's leg. <laughs> this is like a teenager. Yeah. And, and that changed that whole kid's perception about, <laughs> about who's tough, who isn't. I, th- I think there's a lot of like, I, and I see this a lot on like, on the internet and, and also, you know, on the street sometimes, especially when, when people are drunk, when, when people, people think they're tough until they meet someone who actually knows how to fight. And, and, oh, and, and there's so yeah. many times where I'm looking at, when I'm looking at people, I'm like, but dude, you, you don't know how to fight. I don't think you should be coming up to uh, up in someone's face and, and threatening them or doing anything when you don't really know how to throw a punch. It's kind of ridiculous. Oh, people, and oh, people think, people think they know how to fight. I saw a video on, uh, one of these little fight videos online where it's a, a, a guy was at a 24 hour fitness, a little small, like nerdy looking guy. And, uh, you can tell they're kind of, one of the bigger dudes were kind of pushing him around and kind of got in his face. He's like, Hey, I don't want any problems. I don't want to fight. And the guy saw that he had like someone in front, someone afraid of him in front of him. 
Uh, so a big yeah. buff dude start pressing the guy and push him in the corner. And within two seconds, uh, the little guy spun him around and had him in like a leg lock. And I was like, <laughs> oh, you, you don't know who you're <laughs> – it's – because it's, and I found that it's the tough guys who know how to fight are the ones who don't act tough. Exactly, exactly. Because they have confidence. They, they, they don't need that. They've, you know, they've been in the gym for ten years. They've been sparring. They don't need, you know, to go and 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 make a fuss and and be loud. They have confidence. Yeah. Leave it. So. What kind of what what, uh, what kind of dog you have? Oh, that's a uh, uh, she's a mutt. A rescue. That's the mud. Yeah. Yeah. I have I have, I have yeah. two at home as well. Oh yeah. 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 No. Oh man. <laughs> That's the best. So you say you were in New York for you said uh how many years now? Where were you before New York? So originally from Israel and uh um, oh, awesome. yeah, been in New Yeah, been in New York for six years now. And uh I mean I kind of been traveling my whole life, you know, back and forth from different countries, just you know. But uh, I've really, I think this is the longest time I've been in, in one place. I think, yeah, six, six really? and a half years now is probably the longest. Yeah. Yeah. Man, but, I, uh, that, sorry, man. Oh, it's, I, that, that's crazy, man. I, I love that you're doing that much traveling. How do you, how yeah, do you choose I mean, a destination? I, uh, I mean, when I was younger, it was, it was obviously my family, you know, my, my, parents love to travel as well so they kind of just accepted jobs and in, in all these different places and uh you know we traveled we traveled a bit and uh and then i think that kind of stuck with me you know as i grew up uh f- you know i did the army finished the army just decided i wanted to travel and i just feel like there's i and i and i feel this here in new york as well there's a little bit of a of a, of a bubble where, where you live, you think that's the entire world. And when you go and you meet different people, different languages, different foods, different cultures, you kind of see, Oh, okay. There's a different perspective to, to the same issue. There's different views. There's different everything. Yeah. So it's really cool. And that's something I think everyone should do, you know, much more of. Oh, and I know most people uh, can't afford to travel. I was just granted the opportunity with it through uh, all the boxing. So I got to travel to a lot of places, but it's what you're saying about perspective is true. Uh, everyone thinks that their way is right because they don't know that another way exists. Exactly. And you see like other people in their element doing what they do and you kind of understand the reasons why they do it. Uh, yeah. I, I, I enjoy learning about and different I, cultures. And I see that you, I mean, I, I remember I was watching, uh, I think I was following you. I think you were posting a lot from, uh, I believe it was Twitter, but basically that you were, you know, doing the van life thing. I don't know if you're still yeah. doing that. Yeah. Yeah. It's, uh, still. So when, when I, when I first got into speaking for it to be kind of sustainable, uh, for it to be sustainable to, uh, like, kind of afford to travel and the travel expenses and hotels, rental cars, for it to just be cheaper if I just bought a van and, that way, I'd be able to travel, see see the country, and uh, so bought a van, took off July fourth, two thousand seventeen, or two thousand eighteen, July fourth, two thousand eighteen, okay. and uh, yeah, it's probably the first thing I learned right away was uh, you can't take everything with you. So like ninety nine point nine percent of stuff <laughs> yeah. you own is useless, and you it kind of puts everything into perspective because you work so hard to spend money on certain things and. You don't need ninety nine point nine percent of it, and if you yeah. can just spend less money, you can work less. And if you can work less, you can spend time doing things you enjoy. Oh, unless oh. you enjoy, you know, expensive liquor and traveling. But yeah, yeah. So is you know is that is that one of the first things that hit you when you started doing a van life? Just this, I have all this shit that I actually don't need, and I have no emotional. It's no emotional attachment to, and I probably should just get rid of it. Yeah, like you realize how silly sentimental value is because it really doesn't mean anything. Like people keep pictures and in, in their lock boxes and like original copies to tickets, but if your house burned down and you lost all that stuff, you still have the memories and that will have to do for you. So you just have to mentally yeah. burn all your stuff. Uh, yeah. Yeah. And then, yeah, it was, it was freeing. Like I would, when you travel, like you book a, uh, a return flight 
you know, you book a round trip flight, but sometimes you get somewhere and you like it and you want to stay longer. Now that I'm in a van, when I book a flight, I, when I, when I get to a city, I don't have a flight to leave. So I can just stay as long as I want. Uh, that's how I actually am in Portland. I came to Portland last year for the first time in like November. And, uh, I got done with speaking at a school and like, it was quick, like, uh, Thanksgiving break. So I had a few days off, like, I like a week and a half off. I just stayed in Portland and, uh, tried to hit as many different vegan restaurants as I could. Just like sleep in the van, uh, shower, planet fitnesses. <laughs> yeah. It, it, it's not for everyone. Uh, but yeah, it, it it taught me, it, it, it's so freeing. That's what it is. It's free. And that's what I enjoy most about it. Yeah. I think, you know, it's, it's kind of like uh, when people do the Pacific Crest Trail or other large, you know, big adventures or journeys, it's something that, okay, great. Yeah. The, the Pacific Crest Trail and, and, and seeing the landscape and whatever, that's amazing. But I think at the end, it's, what did, what did I learn from this journey? I think a lot of people at the end, they, you know, they come out a little bit different and that's probably what the van life or, you know, I've seen, there's a few people that I follow and they're, and they're living in a boat and they're just traveling the world, living in this amazing boat and seeing the world. So I think, yeah, I think it's the process of, oh, okay, how, how am I changing and what am I seeing myself develop into? <clears throat> True, but then you have a lot of people who like do the travel thing. And they only see uh, their destination through the lens of their phone. True. Because especially now. Yeah. Like they go out and you're instead of, you know, enjoying the view, you're taking pictures of the view and everyone knows the view will never like it. Your picture would never be able to com compare to like what you're actually seeing. No. Yeah. And, I, and I you're also not present, would, right? No. And so when you're talking about what did you learn, a lot of people don't learn anything. But when you're in a van, you don't have a choice. Just... What, uh, what would you say are the, are the big, you know, takeaways for, uh, so far for you, uh, in, uh, doing the van life? Oh, uh, budgeting. I realized because I pay my mortgage by the gallon. Like, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> it's a good one. Yeah. It, it's it's so it like since I cut down my expenses, uh, I I'm, I feel like I'm balling. I'm rich, and I don't even make that much. It's just I don't spend much. Yeah. So and, and when you're not spending, a, when you when you don't have to make money, when you don't have to work, I just I speak as much as I do, and I book as many gigs and travel as much as I do, just because I like to. I don't have to. I mean, I can probably kill it for three weeks speaking, uh, kill it for three weeks and then be done for the rest of the year. I, wow. but I just do it a lot because I enjoy it. I'd actually pay yeah. to, I'd, I'd pay to be able to do what I do. The fact that I get paid to do it. Oh, there's, except for the fact that everyone, what I found weird, everyone likes to complain about something like no matter how perfect your job is or whatever, everyone still like needs to vent. But, I do find find it silly when I when I tell my friends my problems. But <laughs> yeah, I mean, yeah, there's life. definitely a, yeah. I mean, there's um, you know, I I I I had this conversation recently with with a friend. He has a you know, he's got wife, kids, mortgage, etc. Live you know, doing a job he doesn't necessarily like. You know, making it's not even that he's making bank, but he's making you know decent living and. He kind of went, you know, and then I see people who are doing what they love. You know, like I said, they, they, they doesn't matter if it's athletes, doesn't matter if it, if it's you or other people that are want to travel the world and they're finding a way to bring income from traveling the world, like these travel vloggers, whatever it is that, that you love doing, mm -hmm. you find a way to bring income from that. And, and then there's people, you know, like, like my friend who's, he's kind of frustrated because he's in this weird place where he wants to do something. But he's like, no, no, that that's for other people. Like, I, I can't do that. And and I find that a lot. That that's just for people older are, people? Are, it's, that's nice. It's, no, no, he's saying, like, that's for other people. That's for, oh, oh. like, I can't, you know, that's, like, I, I'm not, I can't do that because whatever X, Y, Z in his head. It's just he's either scared or doesn't have the scared. confidence. Oh, it's, 
it's scared. It's it's scary. First of all, there's nothing normal about living in a van. Like I get why someone wouldn't do it, and it, it's it's also scary. If you get your if you get your car towed, you take an Uber. If I get a car towed, I have to get a hotel. Like, yeah, it's difficult and it's scary to take chances, especially if you have kids. I'm only able to live this reckless and like do what I want because I don't have kids. Yeah. So I don't have not like, tethered to anything. No, if I lost everything and I just have to end up on a friend's couch, that's not the end of the world for me. Yeah. But like, but if you have kids, I mean, that's, that's where your priorities should be. If you're, if, if you want to be a good parent. No, <laughs> definitely. I, yeah. But if you don't have kids or anything, I would say, it's it's a very selfish lifestyle. I can go where I want. I don't have to be anywhere. I don't have to come back. Um, so it's yeah. I, I enjoy I, I enjoy this life. But right now, uh, what I'm doing is I'm training for the uh, the Tokyo Games. 2020. Yeah. Yeah. That's uh, I decided to. I've been fighting for Team USA uh, for my whole career. I was captain for like 10 years of the USA national team, but uh, now I decided to uh, fight for Trinidad and Tobago instead. Really? Yeah. Uh, what um, What made you make that switch? Uh, the fight on Team USA, they're too controlling. They're a little too controlling. And uh, they kind of tell you that I wouldn't be able to travel and, and continue my speaking business. I'd be stuck in training camp. and I also coach myself. I don't like people telling me what to do. I'm not into team sports. Yeah. So uh, I, uh, I I flew to Trinidad a couple months ago, fought in the Olympic trials and won, and actually headed out to Trinidad in uh, the end of the week. Going to go out there for a couple of weeks and train. And I have a fight out there. I'm going to be fighting Cuba. Oh, wow. Yeah. So, so you're going to be training with the national uh, team down there. Yeah. And how yeah. how is I mean, obviously you can't compare it to the U.S., but but still, like, how would you compare it to what you know how it is in the U.S.? Oh, uh, we're 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 in the U.S. There's a it's way better funding, like way better funding yeah. in the U.S. And I didn't realize how how much that played a role because. I was, I didn't really have to work uh, when I got started with boxing. And and now, not only do I have to box, I have to also, uh, uh, I got to fund my own trip and my own travel and flying around the world. So I can't completely stop speaking. No. Oh, wow. Yeah. So, so basically, you just fight for them, but they essentially offer you nothing. Yeah. Other than the platform, but, the, other than the oh, platform. Yeah. And I'm, I'm grateful for that. It's just, I mean, it's not like they have it over there. Like, like they have like millions of dollars for it and they just keeping it away from yeah. me. Uh, no, it's just the way it, different countries work in different ways. And like U S isn't as well funded as uh, a lot of the other countries, weirdly, because no one really in America cares about boxing the way they do with other sports, like, like, uh, football. Everyone's going crazy now. With the Chiefs just winning yeah. and going to the Super Bowl, which, which yeah, I'm kind of happy I, uh, about because I'm a Kansas guy. Yeah, you uh, you started uh, training there in Kansas, correct? Yeah, yeah. I still uh, still rent a place out there, or rent wow. a room to leave some of my stuff. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I lived out there um, for about ten years. Before the van, I was living in Kansas City. Was this uh, pre-vegan or post-vegan? Uh, I moved to Kansas City in 2008 and uh, and became vegan in 2012. So, okay, yeah, because I would imagine it's, it's not the easiest, it's not the easiest place to probably find. Oh, you know, uh, yeah, it's, it's a barbecue land, the land of barbecue. Food. Yeah, oh, it's it's yeah. been getting so much better now, though. Uh, really, a guy named a guy named David Sports. Uh, He's it's Casey Life. We've, uh, Casey Life is the name of his nonprofit. He came in from nowhere. He has a uh, a pretty efficient team, uh, a bunch of volunteers in the Kansas City area, and he put on 
uh, he puts on, well, his team, I want to give him all the credit, is a great team. Uh, they've been putting on different vegan events every month. Like they have a, but I can't live without cheese party, where it's like a fancy wine and cheese party. Uh, but it's all vegan cheese and vegan wine. And uh, he put on, the first three years ago, he put on a veg fest. The second annual one, he put on a two day veg fest. The third annual one was last year, last August. Uh, he put it on a three day veg fest. And next year, he's going to, I think, for a four day uh, vegan festival. And there's been a lot, uh, a lot of vegan growth in, in the community. A lot of restaurants and things popping up now. I don't know where that guy came from, but grateful he's around. Yeah. Yeah, you need people like that. There's uh I feel like there's a, there's one or hundreds depending on the community, but there's there's people like that, you know, popping up in every community and and they're really showing people that you can eat differently, you can train differently, think differently. So, you know, definitely grateful yeah. for people like that. Yeah, I'm glad they exist because uh, I'm not that guy. <laughs> I'm not going to be the one doing any of that type of stuff. <laughs> like, but but I don't like so volunteer don't... and help out with stuff. But no, I don't. I don't. I'll, I'll I MC a bunch of vegan festivals. Uh, but I don't like I. I've, my life's too sporadic to like volunteer at a sanctuary or put on events or anything like that. I'm never somewhere yeah. long enough. Yeah, we um, we uh, initially, you know, when I when I went vegan, I was, you know, I was trying to do everything. I was trying to do the try to help events, do events, animal sanctuaries. But oh yeah, yeah, I was kind of like buying, not not that yeah, I was kind of buying into it a little too much. You know, I was being one of those annoying vegans, and now oh, it's, it's after I, I good, get it. It's passion. Yeah. It's an arc. It's, 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 you know, it's, you start off, it's an arc. It's, you start off preachy, annoying, you know, you know, know everything. It's just like you someone, watch, you know, two, two and a half documentaries. Yeah. 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 And James Aspie follows you back on Instagram. You're basically yeah. a, a guru. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. No, uh, <laughs> it's, it's like when someone first finds religion, uh, they want to tell everyone about it. And it, it's not that they're, they're just so excited and happy about it. Uh, so, and I know yeah. a lot of vegans who are like that too. And I, I get why, uh, they're angry vegans because it's just, they're just passionate. And I agree with them on a lot of things. I may not agree with their ways of doing things, but you know what? Uh, and I used to complain of like vegan, the way vegans protest and do this and that. I'm like, I'm not doing anything. It's really easy for me to stay home from my computer and see them doing stuff and say what they should or shouldn't be doing. I feel like everyone, yeah. everyone has their own way of doing things and doing something is better than nothing. But, uh, I think the best something that I can do is doing nothing. Weirdly. So I just feel like if I'm a, why do you, why do you, think, why do you think that? I, I just think if I'm a, if I just do me happy guy, be happy, be successful, win at boxing. Uh, I can just be a good role model for what veganism is instead of preaching about it. Yeah, uh, I, I, I completely agree. I think um, putting your finger in someone's face and screaming at them and telling them, you know, uh, what you're doing is bad and, and you should listen to me and, and change your ways is not the most effective. I think what you're doing and people like you that just, you know, live – you know, live by, by the example that you set. So you're like, look at me, I'm this big dude. I'm a boxer. I'm an athlete. I'm healthy and, 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 and successful or, you know, whatever it is, you know, like look at Rich Roll, like ultra marathon runner, look at, you know, all these guys setting records everywhere. I think that's, that's a much better way to get. And then they're like, Oh wait, this, this, this dude's vegan. Oh, okay. That's, that's very interesting. Yeah. You know, maybe that's something I should look into. And yeah. I think that's where the transformation comes from. Yeah, leading by example. Yeah. 100%. Yeah. I, you have a no. um No, go ahead. No, no, you go for it. No, I was saying I was I was I was when I was kind of like doing a little bit of research, I was on your website and there's a quote there that says although Cam is most known for his failures. And uh that kind of like really stood out for me cuz 
I don't think I personally see you as someone who's successful. And I think most people do, you know, you, you're, uh, you go around, you know, like all the accolades we just talked about, like I, that was kind of like something I was like, I wonder why he put it, you know, in that way. Uh, because all the stuff that all of the awards and stuff that I won that's listed there doesn't show all the awards I went for that I, I, I didn't get. Like, it, when, when it comes to like overall success, people don't look at field goal percentage. So like, here's an example. If you looked at Shaq's career, right? He would look, yeah. it would look like a successful career. Got, he won championships and that. But if you looked at his field, his free throw percentage, it would tell a different story, right? Yeah. So like, there's a lot of things that I did that, that I failed at and. <clears throat> Like even the whole Olympics deal, it took me a long time to be able to get this far, and I still haven't really been there. So, like 2008, I qualified for the Olympic trials, but I lost. Uh, then 2012, I won the Olympic trials, uh, got kicked off the Olympic team and suspended for a year. Then came back to so, boxing, changed the name, just- did all of that. I'm sorry. No, no, you were just cutting off a bit. I think like you're moving oh. around. It's just like oh, breaking up a bit. Oh, no worries. Uh, so 2000, uh, 2006, so didn't make it 2008. 2012, one got suspended. 2016, one didn't qualify internationally. And now it's 2020. So basically been going after the same goal for like 14 years or something, 16 years. I don't know. Carry the one. I don't know. A uh, very long time. Yeah. But to... <laughs> To other people, you see the list of accomplishments. You're like, oh, man, he, what do you mean? It, it, it seems like it's just been nothing but success. But percentage-wise, I'm, <laughs> it's not all that successful. Yeah, And I'm okay with it. Uh, I think too many people judge their successes off of, uh, off of perception. Like Olympic-wise, I'm not very successful. But boxing-wise, I would, I would say I've, I've won more than, than most. Uh, yeah, and and I'm not ashamed of my failures. I'm I actually kind of embrace them. Oh, you have to, you have to. There's yeah. no way. There's no way to grow. There's you know. It's kind of like when you see someone, and I and I see this in mixed martial arts, and I'm sure this is the same in boxing. When you see someone who's on a streak or like never lost, and you know they they've been super successful. After that first time they lose, something oh. changes. They're they're just not the same. Yeah. So, and I think so, that's a, like a metaphor for life. I think you have to go through struggles and, and pain. And with that, you grow and you become better at whatever endeavor that, that, that you're taking on. But you have to go through that. You have to go through struggles. Otherwise, when, you know, something comes up, it's going to break you. It's just, you're not going to be able yeah. to, 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 to deal with it. Yeah. I, and I see, I see a lot of times like, uh, oh, example, McGregor. Like McGregor took a nasty loss. Yeah. Nasty losses. He came back and he looked good last night. Like I do amazing, like amazing. See, you you kind of see who someone is because a lot of times like a dude will get knocked out or or take a loss and just they'll come back but they'll never be the same person. Uh, yeah, and, and it's it's easier to keep winning one heat you're already winning. So I do like seeing uh, resilient athletes. And it's also, it's, um, I think success is such an objective thing, the way people measure it. I mean, if you're a millionaire, but you're extremely unhappy and I don't know, you have problems with your wife and your kids hate you and, and whatever, and you're unhealthy, it's, is that a measure of success? It's just, but then on the flip side, you could be super happy with your wife and kids and family and have a great life. And, but, but you're not super rich. It's just, it's yeah. a weird, like people want to, want to measure their success based on something they can put, you know, in a few bullet points on, on their, uh, bio on me- social media. Uh, they want to measure their success, uh, c- and compare themselves to people in better positions than they are. Because, like, if, yeah. if, like, if I had, do you think you're, do you, would you consider yourself rich? Well, depends. If I compare you to, uh, compare your income to, let's say, income of somebody in a village in a third world poor country, like an underdeveloped country. Yeah. They would mm-hmm. literally give a limb yeah. 
to be in the position you are in and make all the money that you're making and be super grateful. But in your mind, you're like, man, I work too hard at this job. I deserve a raise. I should make more money. Like, I don't make enough. I need a raise. But again, there's someone who will, who would literally kill to be in your position. But again, there are some people with like who have millions of dollars, but all of their friends have billions and they're known as a poor friend. So it's all pretty much perspective. It is. And so basically it's, just it's, hang out with yeah, poor, it, unsuccessful people. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's the way to go. Yeah. You want to feel taller? Just yeah, hang out with short people. That's what you do. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. No, it's, it's a, uh, it's a weird thing. You know, it's, it's money is definitely helpful, especially. Yeah. Money's definitely helpful, but then you have America, which is by most measures, you know, the most uh, successful, the, mo- the richest country yet. Mm-hmm. People are on antidepressants. People are on all these different drugs. People are not happy. People are looking for something outside of, of what the materialistic world offers. And, you know, you see, you saw that with, um, you know, you see it also now, but there was a, I think in the 60s, 70s, like, you know, every, like so many people were joining cults. They were just looking for something else to make them happy. And just people are just, are not happy. Yeah. People are looking for, I think. Community is a huge one. I think a lot of people are very lonely. I think community is a big one and they're not necessarily feeling like they're part of a group, especially with social media nowadays. Like, yes, we are online. You are part of all these different groups, but then you're still at home by yourself or you're still going to the bar and instead of talking to people, you're on your phone. So it's in a way gathered people together, but also in a way isolated us. I wonder what, uh, I wonder if I'd be curious to know what, let's say, uh, the statistics were for people going to bars 10 years ago and com- on a Friday night compared to today, because it seems like people only go out to get a picture for their social media. Definitely. Definitely. hundred percent. Yeah. Guess, uh, would I that think, lead to less DUIs think... though? <laughs> <laughs> so that that and Uber. Everyone's just getting Uber. Yeah. Uber. Yeah. I feel like you get a DUI that, that you just, you're asking for it. Yeah. Well, in New York, I think you see that less because nobody has a car here. So probably yeah. out in California or, or, yeah, here, you know, just nobody has a car. It's all, it's, you know, you're falling asleep on the subway and then you're, oh, wait, I'm in the Bronx. What the fuck? You know, yeah. I, I need to, yeah. I need to go in a different on. direction. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That's actually happened, but yeah. <laughs> yeah. I, I, uh, I, I'm kind of curious where everything is. I I understand that the world needs to move forward. I'm sure back in the 40s or 50s, when television started coming in the houses, uh, old people were were upset because it was taken away from their family dinner time. And you know, it, now we're just a point where. Remember when? Uh, I don't know if you're if you if you were in America for this, but it was a big issue about 20 years ago with people driving and talking on their cell phones. Like they were even trying to outlaw it for for even hand, even if you had a, like a head headphones on, they were still trying to outlaw it because they're like, it's breaking your concentration. It's breaking your concentration. And I really thought I was like, how can driving get any more dangerous? And now you got texting. (laughs) Yeah. So how do you feel about autonomous cars? Oh, I can't wait until Elon Musk decides to make, uh, vans that are autonomous because in my van, I have, I have a, I have a bed, I have coffee maker, microwave, Wi-Fi, uh, everything you need, dresser, everything I need is in there. And I have a desk where I work. Yeah. I work with my Wi-Fi. I have Wi-Fi. And, uh, imagine being able to, cause back in the day, everyone went to New York for business and they went to LA to be discovered. Now that people can be discovered on YouTube, no one really cares to go to LA and spend all that money to be discovered. Uh, yeah. So we're, we're working more remotely. Now, if you can work remotely and live in a van and let's say you put, you're, you're in New York, you, you, uh, you go in the van, you put in a eight hour work shift. When you're done with those eight hours, you started in Brooklyn, but your Thomas van drove you to North Carolina. Now you're in North Carolina for the night. Then you can live in your van. And then if you want to meet up with people, like you, you coordinate with a group of friends, like, Hey, let's meet in Virginia. 
uh, on the on the 29th for two nights. And then you can be able to travel. Imagine having an autonomous vehicle that could do that. So you can work and still travel. Right. I see I see both pluses and minuses. I see it obviously the plus of that is you know, free time, you know, the, this car is completely autonomous. I tell him, Hey, take me to Kansas. And, you know, I'll have to do a sleep in the back and I wake up in Kansas, but I see also the potential of, of, you know, nowadays, let's say again, we're, we're in New York. No one, no one's driving here, but if you're living in the suburbs or, or somewhere else and you're driving in your car now, it's at least you can't work. You know, your boss can't demand of you, Hey, you know, this is, I, it takes me, let's say an hour during a, uh, rush hour to, to get to, you know, it takes me an hour to get to work. You can't work during this time. But then, you know, if you have this autonomous car, you can be working basically oh, well, from the moment you wake up to the moment. I don't know. It, it's, yeah, you, I can see like pluses you're, you're, and minuses you're, to this. You're looking at that as the employee. But if you were an employer yeah. and, and let's say I hired you and because I hired you, you also get this van to work out of and live out of. I also know where you are at all times and I can get in touch with you. <laughs> like, yeah. Wouldn't you get more productive and, employees? Like at Google and all these places, they're, they're giving people like rooms full of kittens to play with, to distress them. And, and they're having like lounge rooms and they're allowing people to have a beer at work. Imagine not even having to go yeah. to work. Would you do your job if you had such a great job with offered freedom? Potentially, yeah, potentially. I mean, I have, I have a friend that, that works in Google and he was like, man, I don't know how anything gets done. He was like, no one works here. <laughs> he was like, yeah. no one works here. He was like, I, I, didn't go to, I didn't go to work for a week. He was like, no one even noticed. Like, yeah, they didn't even say anything. I feel like it's, it's crazy. It's, but if you're drilling, because they say like the average person works like four hours a week of actual work. It's something ridiculous like that. Uh, like really? how little a person... A, how little a person works a week of actual productivity instead of like, you know, buying time or BSing or on social media. Yeah. So their, their theory is if you, if you give them all the time they want in the world to do what they want, they'll actually work harder. It, it's obviously been working because yeah. a lot of people have been following that business model. A lot of these techs and startup companies. But, yeah. Yeah, I could definitely see that. Yeah. Tech, t I mean, yeah. Tech is a, tech's a crazy business, man. It's, it's definitely, it's infiltrated our lives in every single aspect. You know, there's just nothing you're doing now that's not tech related. Um, yeah, super dependent. I, I find it weird that, I find it weird that, Parents are still telling their kids to go to college. I think it's, 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 it's laughable. They've grown to college. They don't really know why they're switching majors. They're just taking electives and they're probably just going to get a job that's going to be lost to a computer. I think they might as well just go to trade school think and save some time. You think it's outdated? Oh, by Colleges? far outdated. A hundred percent outdated. For one, they're still charging all that money for books. And then they change a chapter and they call it a new edition. They make you buy it. If they actually wanted to, the students to learn and not be an inconvenience, uh, they would just give let you download the books on PDFs. But they don't do that because it's a business. And yeah. you know, they just take advantage of all these athletes. And <laughs> there, I know people who like went to these four-year colleges are in debt up to their eyeballs and still use the little bit of disposable money they have uh, to go to like one of the NCAA basketball games. I'm like. They're still taking advantage of these people. Oh, I do see value yeah, in education. I mean, they're, making, but... they're making a lot of money. Yeah. And the, the, these, the cost of colleges. Yeah, these colleges are out. making a shit ton. Yeah. Yeah. They're making a shit ton of money off these, off these guys. How's the cost continue to go up? Yeah, I don't know. We, um, when, I, when I moved here and, and I learned actually how much people are paying for college and the kind of debt uh, – that they leave once they leave college, it, it blew my mind. Cause I know there's, I know there's a lot of, um, Jewish people that come from the U S to Israel. Not a lot actually, but some, 
and to because you know it's great universities as well and and the price of like the highest you know the highest price you're going to pay there for university is probably i would say a quarter of what you're going to pay here yeah. and so education it's, wise it's, how, it's, how, you know, how it's how ridiculous does, how does the level of uh the quality of education compare it's on par oh okay so it would be even yeah just smarter to go out there Exactly. And I know a lot of people from the U.S., they go to, to, to you know, to uh, Slovenia, to, I don't know, all these different countries in Europe, you know, depending on, 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 I don't know, what the visa issues and what they allow, they don't allow. But Hungary, I know I have uh, my, 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 one of my good friends, his, um, his brother-in-law, he went to, I believe it was Hungary to learn, um, to, to become a doctor again for, you know, a portion of what it would cost him here. So yeah. it just, it makes more sense. Yeah. It just doesn't make sense to pay all that money. What I'm thinking is like, if I went to another country just for four or five years to be able to get a job and come back home, I don't think I'll, I could set myself up for somewhere for five years and have any interest of going home. Yeah, <laughs> I could see that. I mean, you develop friendships and then you, you, you lose friendships you know everybody in high school they leave high school like we'll be friends forever i know they say that we won't and then like a year later you don't have the yeah. numbers uh like you you, no, could, no. you could just <laughs> you go to a different country and i don't know i i couldn't imagine uh i can imagine coming back especially after being a doctor but, wait yeah, who, who makes more it's, as a doctor i i think like where would i make more as a doctor i guess where would I make more as a doctor? Oh, okay, definitely here. Back. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, the the market for anything is the U.S. The U.S. You know, that's why every startup. Um, you know, I'm I'm you know I'm kind of I got my 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 foot in, in tech. I got my foot in here in, in a few different places, and all the startups want to come to the u.s like that's the market that's you know it's it's obviously new york and california are the two big ones but everyone wants to come to this market because it's the biggest market and consumers here are more most of their word? money they are it's it's they're more there's there's more interest you know there's a lot of skepticism i think in a lot of d different countries and here there's a uh, promise of you know i will give you the service slash product and it will make your life better. And, and people are interested. People will, you know, invest in that. And, and, and they're, they wouldn't do that in a lot of other countries. I think there's a lot of skepticism and cynicism in, in, um, other places, in other countries that doesn't exist, that doesn't exist here. I, I can understand yeah. why, but here in America, we just love convenience so much. We're willing to take the risk. Yeah. People, yeah. People love convenience. Convenience. Is yeah the number one? I oh, I forget what documentary I saw this where they said um, the number one thing that Americans are afraid to lose is convenience. I forget I saw this in one documentary and that kind of always stuck oh, with yeah. me. Uh, um, uh, there's nothing that matters to me more than convenience. <laughs> so you never you never thought about. Going pro, correct? This, yeah, I remember that was something that you were discussing in the in the, yeah, in the documentary. Yeah, like, pro was never really on my radar. I just wanted to travel and uh, I just wanted to travel and get some stamps in my passport, get some life experience. But uh, turning pro was never my ambition. I was never against it, but I never had a reason to. Uh, a lot of people turn pro because they don't have another option. Uh, but I mean, I, mm -hmm. I I I can speak. I can. I do comedy. I can. I do. I got. I have other avenues. Uh, so I would never turn pro for money. But if I ever wanted something else, uh, I guess if I want something else from the pro game, uh, I turn pro. But it wouldn't be for the money. So is it because you know, not necessarily like you have your whole heart set on? unboxing it because you have so many different avenues like you said comedy and, and speaking engagements that you have you know most people they they're very um singular they have 
one passion that they follow. And then once they finish with that passion, usually they'll go on. But, you know, you you tend to kind of put your... Try to do multiple things at once. You know, put your thing in different... Yeah, yeah exactly. Uh, it It's a lot more fun that way for me. But uh, I'm not completely opposed to turning pro. Before, I used to think I was. But now if I did it, it wouldn't be for money. So I would be okay with turning pro. But as of right now, I'm just still living in the van and enjoying life too much to worry about anything else. Do you have any other uh, future documentaries uh, you're going to no, be involved? No, I think I'm done with documentaries altogether. They're exhausting. They're invasive. <laughs> and yeah. Really? Yeah, they're invasive. And and it, it always has something like for, for it to be any good, it's going to have to involve a passion. And... Yeah, it's, they they want to know everything about your life, and there, there's there's no privacy. Uh, yeah, it was a, it was, wow. it, was, it was a cool opportunity to do. Like for one, if you want to go on a run, and they want to record you going on a run, like so you're going on a three mile run, but now they want to record you on the run, so you have to wait till they get the camera set up to do all that. And then you do the run, they're like, okay, we need uh, B roll. So like, you have to like go out there and do the run again, and then they need to record the run from a different angle. And then you're doing three times the run. Like it's way too much work. Yeah. 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 I always think about that when I, when I'm watching documentaries and you know, obviously there's the part where usually the, the person being interviewed is, is sitting down and he's talking about whatever subject it is, but then there's all this B roll. And I'm always like, it's, it's so staged and I get that. Like you need to build some sort of a narrative. You need to make it a little bit more dramatic, you know, but I always feel like it's so staged and it shouldn't yeah. be because it's a documentary. Yeah, it's, it's very, it's very staged. And like what I learned, like with those reality shows and stuff, they put most of those people in those positions. Oh, I hate like, those. So I found out with Jersey Shore, I was telling someone about this. You're like, oh, like Jersey Shore, uh, they would literally call them and tell them they have to go out. Like even if they were hung over, like they would call them and make them go out because it's their obligation on that show. Because it, what footage would they have if they were home sober? Yeah, exactly. No, it's uh, the whole thing's fabricated and stayed. I, I, you know, sometimes my wife will will put on like a uh, <laughs> just we're you know we're sitting on the couch on the computer whatever, and 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 she'll put on some you know reality show on TV and. Within like a minute or two, I just started like criticizing. She's oh, yeah. like, "Okay, now never mind. I'm, I'm, I'm turning it off. Doesn't matter. Like, I just can't watch it. I just, I just, I start getting infuriated. I'm like, no, but that makes no sense. Why would they? And you part know, me, I just go part off. Of that, so we we can't so watch together, it in, in part the of house that makes, anymore. It, makes me upset about that is I feel like if they're making me watch something stupid, like if if they're producing a stupid show, it's because they think that the viewers are stupid. And in my head, I'm like, I'm not watching these shows because you think I'm yeah. stupid. So I was told if you ever want to know if uh, you're what kind of audience you're considered to be a part of, look at the commercials that come up during your favorite shows. So like if and I always notice this like during like Maury or Jerry Springer or anything like that, uh, all of theirs are uh, pretty like uh, like uh, like ambulance chasing lawyers and and those those type of ads. I'm like, oh okay, yeah. I. I'm not, I'm too good for this. Yeah. <laughs> I shouldn't stoop, stoop no, below definitely. my level. There's, um, <laughs> but I think it's changing. I think, um, I think, you know, consumers slash, I think people in general are just getting smarter. I think they want better content. You know, if you look at the stuff that's on TV nowadays between HBO, Netflix, and the different streaming oh, yeah. channels, it, they're just the content is, is just so much better burst? than what it was five, ten years ago. And I think uh I'm not sure. I mean, what's next right now? There you have streaming. There's just so much content, it's impossible to watch everything. I have <laughs> yeah. like a hundred shows queued. I just I'll never be able to watch now that everything. Netflix it's is impossible. kinda uh is losing their share of the market. Uh because like you have Disney Plus, Hulu, you have uh uh, Apple is doing one. Yeah. Prime. So like they can't like how are they affording to do this? It's going to run out soon. 
Yeah, I mean, I think cable is gonna eventually just die off because I think everyone's gonna be on these oh, type I, of I, streaming I, services. Be... You know, uh, and now you have even like I was, I was saying like ABC. I assume like all those shows like ABC and stuff. I think they're all gonna have uh, their own streaming service, just like they have their own TV station. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> and then it's just. Eventually, you're you're gonna choose the four, five, three, four, five, you know, streaming services that that you like, and the rest are just, I know, they're gonna fade away. They're just that you can't subscribe to fifty different. I, I streaming watch services. all that, but it's just. I guess yeah, everyone will have sense. a chance to be an actor or actress because, I mean, there's so much work out there. They they have to make so many shows. And they already do. I mean, we have YouTube, yeah, there's true. YouTube TV, you know, everyone with a computer or iPhone, you know, and then you have, I don't know, from, uh, what's it called? The, the new yeah. one, uh, TikTok. It's, yeah, it's just, everyone's sort of an actor nowadays. Everyone's the, the, the protagonist of their own movie and they're the star of the show and they want all the attention to them and, and, and getting the followers and the attention and potentially, oh, let me post something. Even it's completely oh. humiliating and stupid, but maybe I'll get famous off of it on YouTube. It it's it's a different world, you know, from what it was even. Oh yeah, just people five, are definitely uh selling selling their souls to buy a little bit of attention. I don't I don't I, I stopped posting. Yeah. And I think reality oh, TV was the yeah. beginning of that. Just social media blew that up. I stopped going online so much. I used to, I used to be averaging about fifteen hundred twenty uh, to two thousand tweets, uh, twenty eight day cycle, and I would be posting on Instagram and Facebook every day and keeping up my impressions. and uh, And then I realized that I was sad all the time, I'm a very emotional person, and that shit would get to me. And uh, I'd just be in a bitchy mood, yeah, because yeah. I, I'm like everyone in the world is just fucking angry, everyone's stupid, and. I realized everyone's just posting negative things online. And as soon as I got offline, I realized that uh, no one's like that in real life. I just haven't been speaking to anyone. Because I'm usually just like stuck in the van. I, go, <laughs> I get out the van. I speak at a school. I go back in the van. I'm on my laptop working and on social media all day and traveling. And I'm always by myself. So I'm on social media. And I realized that uh, it makes me sad. So I stopped. So I, 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 I post and leave. I don't read comments. I don't really care to read timelines. Uh, I just basically check my email now. Yeah. I mean, your Twitter is <laughs> one of my favorite Twitter accounts that I follow. I'll be honest. Like I, uh, it's it, because, I, you know, because I, I kind of, I guess because I interact with, with yeah. your tweets the most, it oh, it usually when you post, it'll be one of the first ones that, that comes up on the page. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Oh. So it, they have the algorithm. So it pops up, but you know, for for everyone that's listening, like you should definitely check out his, you know, his, his Twitter account. It's it's great. Both funny, both you know, criticizing the people that need to be criticized, and both you know, inspirational. Yeah. So you got to. I just had everything. to get myself to stop reading other people's posts so much. Like, it's not enough happy stuff. No, no. T Twitter is is mostly. Yeah, it's it's not good. It's usually the worst out of I think all the social media, um, you know, social from Instagram to Facebook to I don't know Snapchat, and that's this is definitely probably the worst as far as bad content and and bad people oh. and call out oh, it's, cultures. It's only and, getting and, worse. Yeah, it's it's not it's, it's not going to get worse. Uh, yeah. that, like yeah. I'm speaking at schools and I'm having elementary schools reach out to me to talk to me about social media. And I'm like, third graders have phones. Third graders. I yeah, it's crazy. Or that's uh, we. I had I had my first phone when I was 18. Man, so how old are you? Completely different. Okay, so I'm, I'm 31. So like, I got my first. Yeah, I got my first phone. I was in high school, but it was just a pay-as-you-go phone. I mean, yeah, I, remember I guess those, that was yeah. the olden version of just having Wi-Fi on your phone. Just like when you got minutes, you got minutes, but it was limited texting and all that. Yeah. Then, you know, I got a little older and I made it. Oh, huh? we, um, we didn't even have that. We had like, you know, when I got my, it was just literally 
a phone that you could call from. I think yeah. it had text, like uh, you know, a very a very analog yeah. version of what text was. And I think I had like maybe like, and I think afterwards I got like the 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 Nokia one. Oh yeah, it had the the snake, and oh, that's it. That's, that's all that phone was. The Nokia yeah. brick. Yeah, that was the first <laughs> the brick. Exactly. That yeah. was the first one you with, kill uh, someone with with that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. The feature that's going to take over the world. <laughs> Fucking vibrate. Oh, I was so impressed. <laughs> Three minutes after nine. Oh, MySpace. Oh. Yeah. Yeah, we uh, we we were we were late to the game. We uh, you know, I I only had I actually deleted my Facebook many many years ago because I just. Uh, I felt like, like you said, it was just, it was toxic. I didn't, uh, I wasn't really interested in, I have, you know, a list of people that I was quote unquote friends with, but I really wasn't friends with and I really didn't care what they were doing every single day of their lives. So about six years ago, I think I, I deleted my, uh, my Facebook account and, uh, I've actually been much happier since, you know, like, smart move. The only reason why I still yeah, have to yeah. be active is, uh, so, I yeah. need to see that I'm active on social media. Like, because I can't just be a creep with no picture, no website, and no social media presence. <laughs> so I'm just on there <laughs> enough to yeah. post like, pictures this guy? and yeah. speaking and doing stuff. But yeah, it's it's yeah. it's yeah, it's uh, overwhelming. No, definitely. Um, so yeah, Cam, I think uh, you know, I think we hit the. The amount oh. that we needed for today, uh, I think our. Uh, oh, awesome! I think we said about an hour, yeah, so I don't want up? to take too much of your time. You know, I was it actually. So yeah, I'm gonna post this up uh, okay, next me. month. But uh, yeah, good luck. I really wanted to say, send, send me the links, so. uh, and I'll make Sorry? sure I share it and everything. <laughs> yeah, definitely, hundred percent, man. Um, yeah, thanks again for you know coming on, talking. Had a Yo, blast. An hour yeah, flew by. It felt like 10 minutes. Uh, and I'll leave this and, uh, ringer uh, open. I'll read this. Uh, yeah. I'll leave it open. Uh, yeah, I appreciate that, man. And um, yeah, so maybe, you know, we'll do it again in the future. But, you know, again, thanks so much for coming on, man. Really had a blast. Awesome, man. Take and, care. Uh, yeah, we'll catch up soon. All right. Bye-bye. Right, right, have a good one, man. Thanks again. Awesome, man. Take and, care. Uh, yeah, we'll catch up soon.